This video is made possible by Surfshark. Stay tuned to find out how you can get 83% off your subscription and three extra months for free. Monaco, the seaside principality that has become a haven for sports stars and everyone else that doesn't like paying tax. It's famous for the glitz and glamour and, for certain parts of the year, being the host of some motor racing, driving around on a circuit too narrow to walk on. The Monaco Grand Prix is the main event of the year sports-wise for the principality, with the residents having the luxury of watching the race from their balconies and throwing caviar onto the peasants below. Although before that, you get to see some of the cars of the past being driven around at a relatively brisk pace. This is the extremely beautiful Ferrari 312B which was once driven by three-time world champion Nicky Lauda. Although in 2021, it was being driven by Jean Alesi. Alesi, for those of you perhaps unaware, is one of the more popular Formula 1 drivers that has ever walked the face of the earth. A daring driver who was visibly talented behind the wheel and produced some spectacular racing, with some even comparing him to Gilles Villeneuve. He was also notable for his weird-ass way of holding the steering wheel. Like in a row car, the 10 to 2 arrangement is fine. I guess, but in a Formula 1 car, it was strange. But despite the praise that surrounds him, when you look at the stats in Lacey's time in Formula 1, they're not brilliant. Or at least, they don't seem to stack up to the legend built around him. And it does seem strange, when you watch Lacey drive, how this guy didn't go on to achieve much more success than he actually did. And then for his career to sort of fizzle out like it did, not a lot of it made sense to me. Like, what the f*** happened to this guy? Born in Avignon, France, Alessi was engrossed in the automotive culture thanks to his father. Jean's first outing behind the wheel came about when he was 16 years old, debuting in go-karts. He eventually graduated to cars in 1983, driving in the National Renault 5 Turbo Series. After hanging around in that championship for a couple of years, Alessi moved on to Formula 3 in 1986, competing full-time in the French Championship. He would take two wins that season, finishing second in the championship behind Yannick Dalmas. He also competed in the Monaco and Macau F3 Grand Prix, with varying levels of success. A decent, albeit not exactly groundbreaking season. However, in 1987, Alessi would once again compete in the French F3 Championship, this time winning the title and finishing second in the Monaco F3 race. However, his performance at the Macau Grand Prix left a little to be desired. And actually, while we're on the subject of Macau, we might as well talk about his last attempt at the race in 1988. After starting the weekend well by qualifying on the third row of the grid, Alessi would put himself in prime position to f*** things up for himself immediately at the start, spinning out to avoid JJ Leto. Alessi was fortunate enough to find out the race would be restarted. However, with a broken rear wing that was producing anything but downforce, it would be a hard ask for him to even finish on the podium. But that's exactly what he did. In the second part of the race, Alessi would spend a lot of time in second position, which would have won him the Grand Prix overall. However, a puncture on the final lap of the race put all of this into disarray and kind of summed up his experience in Macau, which was only half as depressing as watching Valtteri Bottas trying to defend. Having said that, Alessi's focus would be in the Formula 3000 championship that was held throughout Europe. Driving for Orica alongside Pierre-Henri Raffanel, Alessi would finish 10th overall that year. Despite achieving a podium at Poe, the rest of that year's results were pretty f***. In average. Internal issues within the team didn't really help him either, although a man who had a knack for spotting talent and sifting through the bullshit saw something in him. That man was Eddie Jordan. Drafting him in for the 89 season, Alacy would be tied on points with Eric Comas at the end of the year. But with Alacy's three wins at Poe, Birmingham, and Spa against Comas's two wins, Alacy secured the title. <laughs> The remarkable thing is that he won the title despite not competing in the final round of that series. And that's because, all the while, he was competing in another series. Let's rewind back to July that year. The Tyrrell Formula 1 team was preparing for the French Grand Prix and had come into possession of sponsorship from Camel Tobacco. Unfortunately, this clashed with the personal sponsorship of their driver, Michele Alboreto, who was being bankrolled by a rival company. Alboreto would not tolerate this and so walked away from Tyrrell, pledging his allegiance to Marlborough to drive for LaRousse, who was sponsored by Camel. Sometimes you have to envy the way the Italian mind works. Kind of unlucky for Alboreto though, he probably wouldn't have had that problem if he was sponsored by Surfshark. In the barren ocean of online content, there's a heap of websites and things that take your info without you even knowing it. I know right, what's the world coming to? But you can swim under that radar with Surfshark VPN or Virtual Private Network. You can stop websites from tracking your info and selling targeted ads to you. I mean have you ever been saying something out loud in a room about a certain product or 
Whatever. And then for that thing to appear in a targeted ad to you, yeah, you don't like that either, eh? Plus, with Surfshark's Hacklock ID protection, you'll get an alert whenever some Emmy Award winner is trying to break into your email. But a personal favorite feature of mine is that you can see content that's not available in your area. It's not quite as nefarious as it sounds. So, for example, if Netflix decided, in their infinite wisdom, not to show a certain TV show or movie in your region, you can negate this with Surfshark. Does this sound good? Yeah, I thought so. For freedom and protection online, click the link in the description and use this code. Use this code and you'll get 83% off the regular price and three months of free service. They also offer a 30 day money back guarantee, which you can't really complain about, eh? So thank you once again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. If only El Barreto had a sponsor like this. Oh yeah, let's get back to that. So over at Monza, Alessi was testing Formula 3000 machinery. This was brought to an abrupt halt, however, when Jordan gave him the word that he was going to be racing in the French Grand Prix that weekend and that he needed to get over to the Tyrrell factory pronto. A one race deal was signed and so he had a new Grand Prix debutant on our hands, rocking up to the circuit Paul Ricard, donning his helmet, which was inspired by a man who was killed at this very circuit. Alacy would be forced to deal with the fact that his debut would come after no practice in the car, or any Formula 1 car for that matter. But this didn't stop Eddie Jordan from placing a bet with Ken Tyrrell that Alacy would beat teammate Jonathan Palmer that weekend, placing the bet right in front of Palmer. After a few teething issues on the lead up to qualifying, Alacy was forewarned that not qualifying the car was a possibility, and if it did happen, to not worry about it too much. It's motor racing. Shit happens. Alacy went out on his first qualifying run and immediately was way faster than teammate Palmer. He got bought by traffic in the second qualifying session. Although this was a mixed blessing, as had he qualified any higher, he probably would have been in the flight path of Mauricio Guzman Airlines heading into turn one. This brought out the red flag, which gave the Tyrrell mechanics time to mend Alacy's car, which he somehow managed to break in time for the restart. After keeping his nose clean throughout the entire race, Alacy romped home in P4, again ahead of teammate Palmer, which made Jordan a few quid richer. But while Tyrrell have lost a few bob to the village idiot. He was extremely impressed with Alacy after having done what he did without setting foot in a Grand Prix car until that weekend. Still in need of a driver for the remainder of the season, Alacy was given an 18 month contract to drive for the team. At the British Grand Prix, Alacy headed into Club Corner with intentions of passing the extremely stupid Philippe Alio. Unfortunately, Alacy didn't use much brain either, attempting to take the corner flat out before finding out that it wasn't really a flat out corner, thus bringing his race to an end. Despite missing out on a couple of races, Alacy would score two more points finishes that year. While that doesn't sound amazing to pretty much anyone who doesn't understand anything before 2021, it was pretty good going, finishing ninth in the standings that year despite only completing half of it. It's fair to say that Alacy had a pretty decent season, but it was going to get a little bit better from here on in. The beginning of a new decade saw Alacy remain with Tyrrell, and now with a new teammate, Satoru Nakajima. The speed demonstrated by Nakajima in the early part of his career meant that Alacy was under no threat. Qualifying on the second row of the grid, Alacy made the most of a clean getaway by diving down the inside of Gerhard Berger's McLaren to take the lead of the race. He began to romp away from the field, although as the race went on, he was eventually reeled back in again as the formidable Ayrton Senna began to chase him down. Heading into turn one, Senna made a lunge down the inside of Alacy, taking the lead. Jean didn't take a liking to this, and so yeeted his way back down the inside of Ayrton. This caught him unawares. It caught everyone unawares. Who is this peasant driving in a Tyrrell? How dare he challenge the almighty Ayrton Senna? Well, he did. And for now, he was still leading the race. One lap later, Senna made the move again, but this time, he was wise to the counter-attack. Although he probably wasn't expecting Alacy to perform the switchback and challenge for the lead once again. This dude was like a honey badger that's getting stung to shit by bees and still going after they honey. Senna went on to win the Grand Prix, although Alacy was the star of the show. A new superstar had arrived on the scene or so he hoped. Alacy continued to perform in the next few races, and after finishing second in the Monaco Grand Prix, he was now sitting third in the championship, just three points behind Gerhard Berger, and not a long way either from Senna. But then, as is so often the case with the drivers that end up in this bloody series, it all started to go wrong. For the remainder of the year, Alacy would not score any more points, which isn't ideal, but perhaps more messed up, was what happened with regards to contracts. You see, despite the slight issue of John not scoring any points, he was a commodity within the paddock. People up and down the pit lane were chasing his signature, with the more notable one being Frank Williams, owner of the Williams F1 team. This was all music to Jean's ears, and so signed the dotted line for the 1991 season. Except, it didn't pan out that way. Basically, Frank promised to announce a Lacey's signing at the French Grand Prix in 1990. But guess what didn't happen that weekend? No one really knows why. Either potential sponsors were not keen on the idea of a Lacey driving for the team, or more perhaps because Frank Williams was chasing Senna to drive for the team. Now, now please keep with me here, because even I'm going to get lost. 
Ah, f*** it. Basically, at this point, Nelson Piquet had told Lacey he should give Frank an ultimatum. If you don't announce me by Silverstone, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. Although, with that being said by Nelson Piquet, it could mean just about anything. But then Nigel Mansell announced his supposed retirement after Ferrari wouldn't grease his nipples or whatever. And so now there was a vacancy at Ferrari and Frank now wants Nigel as well as Ayrton but has a contract with a Lacey which he hasn't announced yet because reasons. I mean, I don't know. This was all just a mess. No wonder Jean left for Ferrari. Wait, what? Yet, yeah, somehow, through all of this, Jean found his way to Maranello to race for a team, despite being contracted to another one. But hey, Ferrari, the prancing horse, the heart and soul of Formula One. This was a prime opportunity for him, eh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they came off the back of a strong season. <laughs> But as we know with Ferrari, one good year doesn't necessarily carry over to the other one. This was one of those. Prost had the measure of a Lacey throughout the year, despite the former describing the car as a truck. Ferrari took this tongue-in-cheek comment in good cheer by firing him before the end of the season. This meant that a Lacey was now the number one driver for the team, which effectively meant that the weight of Italy was now on his shoulders. Or so it seemed. The good news for him heading into 1992 was that the car was even slower. There was now no realistic chance for him to win a race and instead had to pray that it rained so that he could show off his boat driving skills. And especially at the Spanish Grand Prix where, after a strong start, was punted off by Berger and sent down the order. After pitting for a fresh set of boots, Alesi began to charge up the field with some awesome driving, with the occasional not so awesome driving, which saw other cars get nerfed. While Mansell would win his cakewalk, Alacy would round out the podium after a daring, albeit somewhat maniacal drive. A fantastic drive in Canada gave the Frenchman another podium. However, something that plagued he and the Ferrari team that year was an ever-present issue, where the engine would constantly run into what the Italians call mancanza di vita or absence of being alive. Put more bluntly, it blew its guts all over the track, which doesn't really help Alacy with the simple task of, you know, finishing races, let alone getting podiums. This rang true in France, where his drive in the wet left many people aghast, matching the Williams times. What is this witchcraft? Of course, it couldn't last. Alacy came by to complete lap 61, but would not return to complete lap 62, his engine already having given up due to the embarrassment of being lapped by Riccardo Patrese. Ferrari gave him a new car halfway through the season, which was slightly better, Whenever he wasn't running into other cars, he finished the year in P7, a somewhat deflating position for the prancing horse's number one driver. Unreliability with the car in 93 made Alacy seriously consider filing divorce papers with Ferrari. But after finishing third at Monaco, Alacy thought this to be a turning point and duly signed on for another two years with the Scuderia. But whatever the magic was that transpired in Monaco, it wouldn't really work out for the remainder of the year. Despite another podium at Monza, he was now three years with the Scuderia and no wins. This wasn't exactly what he had in mind when he signed up for this gig. But when 19 94 came around, the tide started to turn. The car started to perform better. Despite missing out on two rounds that year after injuring himself in a crash, he put on a good string of results in the first half of the season. But then his engine came over all Italian again. For the next four races, he would not finish a Grand Prix. Although he did score a pole position at Monza, which doing so in a Ferrari gave Alessia a sort of status in Italy only reserved for God and Eiffel 65. But when his gearbox failed while making a pit stop, while in the lead of the race, Alessi was Pissed. He walked away from the paddock, got in his car, and sped back home to Avignon with his foot flat to the floor. He didn't care anymore. His race was ruined, as it was so many times with Ferrari, who could not deliver him a car that would finish a race. Although admittedly, it wasn't always Ferrari's fault. Sometimes a Lacey would be his own worst enemy. With all of this, it seemed that a Lacey would never win a Grand Prix with Ferrari. Spending your 31st birthday behind the wheel of a Ferrari Formula 1 car is not a bad gig. It was the Canadian Grand Prix and prior to the start, he vowed to be more aggressive in the opening laps of the race. So what's new? After starting from fifth on the grid, he worked his way up and found himself behind reigning world champion Michael Schumacher, who was leading a dominant effort for the Benetton team. It seemed that Schumi was destined to win before his electrics decided to keep the car in third gear, gifting the lead to a Lacey. With the luck he'd had so far, you would think that his car would pack up and leave him on the side of the road, but it didn't. After four years of trying, after four years of heartache, Jean Lacey finally got his first Grand Prix victory to the elation of like, everybody. This was a moment of euphoria for him, but almost immediately after the race ended, rumors about Ferrari had signed Schumacher for the 1996 season. It was later confirmed that he would be indeed signing with the Scuderia and that he would be replacing Jean. Coming close to more wins that year, Alacy's final stint with Ferrari was pretty much the same as it had been for the whole of his time there. Fast, 
but with a violent tendency to cause drama. Although it was this mercurial attitude that led to some amazing drives. At the Japanese Grand Prix, he was given a stop go penalty for what he described as no reason. This put him way back down the pack and seemingly out of contention. But this is Jean Lacy we're talking about. From 15th place, he climbed through the field, fell back down it again, went back up it again, was gaining on the leaders, found himself in second place, and gaining on Schumacher hand over fist. At this rate, he was sure to take the lead. Then, he retired on lap 24, the Ferrari technology once again failing him. He celebrated his last race with Ferrari by crashing into Schumacher, a dismal end for the fan favourite. But on the plus side, he would be headed to Benetton for 1996. The defending champions, maybe this would provide the elixir of life that was so dearly needed for him. Well, of course, I think you all know the answer to this. When Schumacher left for Ferrari, he took a lot of Benetton personnel with him. The team was gutted, although Jean had problems of his own. After crashing twice at the start of the year, he was told by team boss Flavio Briatori that there were to be no more errors from either he or teammate Berger. Alessi every so often found himself leading some Grand Prix, only for his car to fail him. The more things change, the more they stay the same, eh? Having said that, he would actually achieve eight podiums that year to help propel him to fourth overall in the standings. Although heading into 1996, Seven, bloated Betelgeuse told him that if he did not deliver the goods, he was out. Alacy took heed of this by running out of fuel in Australia, having ignored team orders to pit for, you know, fuel. There was other stupid shit that year as well. And so despite achieving decent results that year, Flav had had enough and left Alacy out of the team's lineup for 1998. He duly signed for Sauber, a team not exactly known for being creme de la creme, but it nonetheless gave him a seat on the grid to prove his worth. He outperformed the machinery he was given, and this was noticed by, of all teams, Ferrari. The team was looking to replace Eddie Irvine for 2000, and Schumacher had said that having Alacy as the team's second driver would be ideal. Granted, he would have been a lapdog, but heading into the season of 2000, it would have made Alacy a perpetual front runner. Instead, he would sign for Prost Grand Prix. Now, if we want to talk about bad moves, this is one of them. The car was nothing short of shit house, and even Jean's heroics couldn't make it work. He ran around in the car for a year and a half before joining Jordan for a short-term stint in 2001, a reunion with the man who gave him his big break in motorsport all the way back in 1989. It wouldn't last long, however, as for 2002, the team opted to sign Takuma Sato and Giancarlo Fisichella, leaving a lacy hung out to drive. He was offered a drive at Arrows, but he wasn't interested in driving for a backmarker team, and even if he did join them, the team would die just a few races into that season. When the 2001 season came to a close, the sun had also set on Alacy's Formula 1 career. He did complete some testing for McLaren in 2002, and was even in the frame to become their official test driver. But where Alacy's main efforts lay was within the DTM Touring Car Series, where he ran with relative success for a few years. After that, Alacy would do everything from Le Mans to Indy, to being a test driver for the Lotus T125 project. It's John Alacy, who I used to hero worship, is playing with my genitals. That's nasty. He also managed the racing career of his son Giuliano, which in itself is a bit of a trip, selling his Ferrari F40 to watch his son battle the likes of a man who was regarded as one of the greatest drivers to ever come out of Asia. A driver who, when given the machinery, can make it fly. Sean Galile. Overall, what do we say about this guy? He put on some Herculean performances in his career, was much adored by fans, and very highly rated within the paddock. Why did it all go so wrong? Why didn't he win more races, or challenge for championship titles? Well, there are a few reasons. Firstly, his choice of teams were untimely. Even by Alonso standards, had he kept to his Williams contract in 91, he would have been there when the team was indomitable, and most likely would have meant more wins, and possibly a shot at the title. He then went to Ferrari, which brought up the second problem, reliability. He had none. Whether it was Ferrari or some other team, Alacy would find himself leading a Grand Prix, only for his car to take a cyanide pill before he could reach the chequered flag. This ruined too many opportunities for him and made the results look a lot worse than what they actually were. But then there is the third reason for why it all went wrong himself. As much as we all love Jean, he made a great many mistakes throughout his career which really hurt his reputation and his results. Had he kept a call ahead, perhaps he may have finished a few more races? Having said that, it was because of this attitude that he put on the drives that he did. You can't really win with this one. Still though, even in 2021, he remains ultra popular, especially with the Tifosi, because his personality, as well as his driving style, was a breath of fresh air compared to someone like Terry Bootson, who was more boring than an empty void. And it's for this reason why, when you witness him driving a classic Ferrari Formula One car around the streets of Monaco, it just feels right. You get the sense that everything is right with the world, that nothing could possibly go wrong. Anyways, thank you all for watching, drop a comment below, subscribe to the channel if you're awesome, and always remember, keep it respectful, be wholesome, don't be a manus, and as always, I'll see you all later.